Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, and welcome wherever you may be in the world to a very special presentation by Quirk Books and the show must go online. I'm Robert Miles, actor, writer, director, and creator of the Shakespeare Deck. And this week, we are exploring scenes from Ian Desher's Shakespeare's The Taming of the Clueless. If this is your first time seeing a show must go online presentation, our self-isolated actors across the globe collaborate from their living rooms using ingenuity, resourcefulness, and found items to bring to life the complete works of Shakespeare every Wednesday at 7 p.m. BST or 2 p.m. EDT over at youtube.com forward slash Rob Miles. Whether you're a Shakespeare fan or you've never seen Shakespeare before, we'd love for you to join us for Love's Labour's Loss this Wednesday, a play that is every bit as flirty, dirty and fun as Clueless. Uh, the show will last for approximately 40 minutes, after which we'll introduce you to the cast and crew, followed by a 20-minute Q&A with the author himself, Ian Desher, and the team. If you enjoy what you see tonight, please visit quirkbooks.biz, where you can buy Ian's books, and they'll share 30% of the profits with the show must go online, that's us, uh, for all books bought in the month of May. You can find the link to the shop in the description. For tonight's show, please capture your reactions using the hashtags Pop Shakespeare Live and Show Must Go Online. Be sure to follow us at TSMG Online Live and follow Quirk Books at Quirk Books on Twitter. At this time, to introduce our special presentation, it's my very great pleasure and honour to welcome the author himself, Mr Ian Desher. Ian Desher is the best-selling author of the William Shakespeare's Star Wars series, the Pop Shakespeare series, and other books combining Shakespeare and pop culture. He holds a bachelor's degree from Yale University, a master's degree from the Yale Divinity School, and a PhD from U uh, Union Theological Seminary. Ian lives in Portland, Oregon with his spouse Jennifer, his children and his dog Thorfinn, which I'm very excited about. William Shakespeare's The Taming of the Clueless is his 12th book, all published with Quirk Books. Ian, it's a pleasure to have you on the show to introduce your work. The play, as you know, is Taming of the Clueless and the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. The show must go online. Um, so let's dive in. It's 1995. Take yourselves back. Many of you probably weren't alive. Um, but Clueless is in movie theaters. I don't remember when I first saw Clueless, but it was probably sometime that year, if not in the theater, then I know it was shortly after. 1995 was the year that I graduated from high school and started college. I was four years into my love affair with Shakespeare. Right, a Shakespearean version of Star Wars. William Shakespeare's The Taming of the Clueless is my 11th reimagination of a film into something like Shakespeare's plays. Every time I'm faced with a new film, there are unique challenges, things I haven't done before. With Clueless, there were issues of adaptation, music, and setting. Let me walk you through those three. First, adaptation. As I mentioned, high school was formative for my love of Shakespeare and introduced me also to Jane Austen. I read Pride and Prejudice during my third year of high school, and I sought out other Jane Austen titles on my own. The movie Clueless, of course, is an adaptation of Jane Austen's novel, Emma. Have you ever seen the 1996 movie, Multiplicity, starring Michael Keaton? In that movie, Keaton's character is a busy man who gets the opportunity to clone himself. One clone becomes two clones, and then two clones make a third clone from themselves. That third clone is not very bright. And the second clone says, you know how sometimes when you make a copy of a copy, it's not quite as sharp as the original? Writing William Shakespeare's The Taming of the Clueless, which is, of course, an adaptation of Clueless, which is already an adaptation of Emma, reminded me of that scene from Multiplicity. Was I making a copy of a copy which wouldn't turn out as sharp as the original? I did what I could to give Jane Austen her due. Here is how Austen's novel begins. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence, and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. She was the youngest of the two daughters of a most affectionate, indulgent father, and had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, been mistress of his house from an early period. Her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses, and her place had been supplied by an excellent woman as governess, who had fallen little short of a mother in affection. That's how Emma begins. At the beginning and end of my book, in scenes you won't hear today, a narrator named Jane enters. This is her opening speech, which is also a sonnet. Cher, handsome, clever, rich, who had a home most comfortable, a happy disposition, seemed to unite wherever she did roam the blessings of existence's condition. She lived for some untrammeled 16 years within the world with 
little to distress or vex her. Nothing brought her unto tears, though on herself she could have pondered less. Her father treated her indulgently. Cher's mother died too long ago for her to have any distinctive memory of the caresses she did once confer. Behold what challenges to Cher arrive, the romance of a virgin who can't drive. So that's how I handle this situation. As much as I try to honor Shakespeare with my ad adaptations, hopefully this one is also honoring Jane Austen. The second issue is music. In addition to Jane the narrator, I added another new character whom you'll meet in a few minutes. This is Balthazar, named for the Balthazar of Much Ado About Nothing, who sings the song, Sigh No More, Ladies. His purpose in my book is to provide the music. Clueless is the first movie I've adapted that has a soundtrack com comprised almost entirely of pop music. And the regular appearance of Balthazar is my way of featuring the film's songs. So that's music. And let's talk finally about setting. Clueless is also the first love story I've adapted, if by a love story we mean the story ends when the lovers come together. It's probably closer to a plot Shakespeare might have used than any of my other books. In that sense, it's also pretty timeless. It could be one of Shakespeare's comedies. I made a choice shortly after I started writing the book that it would be written as though it could take place in Shakespeare's time. Although the movie Clueless contains cell phones, computers, cars, TVs, and so on, William Shakespeare's The Taming of the Clueless strips away the technology to leave a tale that could have been written in the 1590s, mostly. There are still some anachronisms. The characters still talk about Jason Priestley, The Mall, and Beverly Hills. Shakespeare, of course, was no stranger to anachronisms, but the setting is still the turn of the 17th century. Finally, I should say thank you to Rob Miles, Sarah Peachy, Alex Pearson, and the entire The Show Must Go Online team. When I watched their first production in March of The Two Gentlemen of Verona, I had no idea that they would soon be bringing their talent, imagination, and joy to my books. So a special thanks to all of them, and thank you for joining us today. And now, on with the show. Thank you very, very much, Ian. That was a fantastic introduction. I'm sure everyone will enjoy the play all the more because of it. And now, it is my great pleasure, honour, and indeed privilege to introduce you to selected scenes from Ian Desher's Shakespeare's The Taming of the Clueless. Act One. Scene One. The Horowitz House and Bronson Olcott High School. Enter Dion. Amber. Whoa! Balthazar, Summer, Murray, Elton, Sher, and other students at a party! Noble patricians, patrons of my right, be like you look upon mine excesses. My friends and I all gathered near the pool, arrayed in swimsuits, sun upon our backs, the very height of beauty, youth, and joy. No cares about the future, come what will, and wonder, hath I somehow stepped inside a strange advertisement for cleansing cream? Noxima, goddess Greek of lasses pure, hath no role in the drama that we play. Take mine assurance, nobles, groundlings, both. I am a teenage girl of normal life who never looked to rise above her place or face the world with aught but normalcy. <laughs> Behold, beyond the window neath the sky, the rushing carriages to pass thee by. Whilst I do sit to loneliness resigns, and ponder wherefore questions fill my mind. Tis Friday night, I feel the soothing heat, and search this filthy city for a beat. Downtown, the young ones go hey nani nan. Downtown, the young ones go hey nani nan. We're the children of America. The children we are to America. My days are spent. I'll wager as yours are. Each morn I'll rise with brushing of the teeth. 
and choose my clothing for the days to come. So many dresses, doublets, pantaloons, vests, girdles, blouses, hose, and shoes <laughs> in combinations of the rainbows used that I must use a system most advanced to tell me whether what I did select displays a fashion sense befitting of a reputation as a lady fine. <gasps> Once I am satisfied, my garments shall give compliment unto my disposition. I am prepared to say good morning to my father, Mel. A litigator, he. His are the most ferocious types of lawyers. He charges forth with lawsuits like a knight and storms 10 castles ere the noon bell rings. Our cleaning woman, Lucy, fears his strength and rushes from him when he entereth. So skilled, my father, is that he may charge 500 ducats should he choose to grant his talent, voice, and wisdom to your suit. Tis privilege to know the mighty man, and better yet to be his only daughter. He fighteth like a pugilist against his enemies across the courtroom floor. Yet though so many pay him for the honor, he fighteth me for free. <laughs> for I am daughter to the mighty Mel. To thine own self be true. Act one, scene three, West Side Pavilion Mall. Alas, poor Yarrick. I knew him, Horatio. Most teachers took the bait as I had hoped. In education physical, I told my tutor that a spiteful, brutal man had rent my heart in twain deceitfully, told her how I could neither eat nor sleep. So painful was the matter twixt we two. She comprehended, totally agreed, for she was ne'er enamored of their sex, she gladly raised my C unto a V, concerning unto better in a trice. I promised Lady Geist that I would start a movement, a campaign of letters sent unto the halls of Congress to object to violations of the Clean Air Act. One stone though, even I, a mighty force, still found immovable and could not budge. Firm Master Hall was rigid as a rock and thrice as hard. He labeled my debates unresearched, unconvincing and unstructured. As if, as if no research I had done. As if mine arguments did not persuade as if my points flowed not sequentially, as if I were no expert of debate. I felt most impotent and sans control, which is a hateful, irritating state. Some sanctuary needed I wherein to gather all my thoughts in one accord, regain my strength that I might be prepared to charge renewed once more unto the breach. Tis wherefore I have come unto this place, this refuge mine, Westside Pavilion Mall. What is the matter on thy mind, sweet friend? Thou visage darkens like a dusky eve. <gasps> Dost suffer the remnants of fire's mind? Nay, nothing purchased yet have turned regret. All day within these markets have I roamed, procuring garments, new and sundry trifles. Yet inspiration thunderbolt strikes not. No lightning comes illuminating the case of Master Hall and how to change his mind. Much I've attempted to convince of a mind scholastic aptitude, yet I was brutally rebuffed each time. Uh, be done with all thy Herculean effects. He is a little miserable man who would make all as desolate as he. Thou hast it, Dee! A true advisor 
I vow, we must make him exceedingly content. Think thou else we know of Master Hall. The man is single, stands a paramour. His age is 47, not a youth. He earneth minor ducats at a job wherein he garners little gratitude. He needeth boinkage for his boring bed. Unfortunately, his romantic options are few and far between within our school. A drought of eligible bachelorettes, a female famine for his feasting flame. Oh, the evil trollish women who teach math have husbands, which is most incalculable. The grand tradition of sports teachers lives as Lady Stoger plays but women's games. But what of Lady Geist? I'll not discount the hair and possibilities therein. Yea, she is off beset by running stockings, a slip that air peeks out beneath her skirt, more paint upon her teeth than on her lips. She nearly screams of renovation fool. We too may be the women's only hope. Upon the instant, we'll enact our plan to bring good Lady Geist and Master Hall into a mountain of affection, the one within the other. I would fain have it a match, and I doubt not to but fashion it. Oh! We'll write a letter signed by one who doth call himself admirer secret. <sighs> Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, but thy eternal summer shall not fade. Dost thou create these words? Thou clever bard! Nay, tis quote from poet much renowned, whom all do read and love, or some day will. Well, who is the writer, for I know them not? One Clifton hilly glass of Cliff Notes fame will place the letter in her postal box and set her in the path of Master Hall, if we can do this, Cupid is no longer an archer. Yeah, his glory shall be ours, for we're the only love gods, verily. Come, let us put this plan to action now and tie the cords of love around them somehow. <sighs> Act two, scene two, school canteen. The food thou eatest, is it truly free of every element that causeth fat? Yea, and loseth weight by cutting it into far smaller bites than usual. Tis science, pure and simple. Ladies, heed, I've met a man who caused my heart to swoon. Describe him to us, we may know the lad. His hair is long, cascades like waterfall. His wit is humorous beyond compare, matched only by his generosity, for quickly did he proffer me some smoke. Behold him there! By smoke thou meanest drugs? Yeah, for to aid my creativity, I took invention in a noted weed. Ty, tell me plainly, what is thy young age? 16 in May. My birthday is in April. As someone older, wiser than thyself, I must perforce share with thee some advice. Tis one thing to partake it doobies at a party where one sparketh up with friends. Yet yeah, tis quite another to be fried always. Thy brain air poisoned. I do know his spirit and will not trust one lazy as he with a drug of such damned nature. Those he has will stupefy and dull the sense a while, with which, perchance, he shall bake himself. Can't thou see the distinction twinks these two? A social smoking versus a constant flames? Methinks I can. Their type, the lodies, hang about the grassy knoll with hacky sacks. They come to class and say their foolish lines, which we, as at a jester, laugh withal. Yet no lass of respectable renown would seek a paramour among their kind. Thou wouldst not start thy journey with a step taken the wrong direction, wouldst thou? Nay. A notion comes to mind that thou mayst like. Shall we give thee a makeover, my friend? Oh, it would be a joy. 
<laughs> Nay, tis not fit for me. Oh, let us, I pray, to share's main joy in life, to play at making over her companions. It giveth her a sense of full control amongst a world of chaos and confusion. Mid such a calm, her talents flourish quite. I pray thee, let us! Wherefore not, we shall. Unusual this is, my friends, that I should have computers responsible as ye. Thy meaning tie is enigmatical. Yet, yeah, let us homeward after school to day, where we this matter shall with joy pursue. Thy reddish dye will lather from your hair and paint thy face to seem most natural, whilst curling thine already wavy locks. Thy clothes we shall with scissors shorten that thy shirts expose some of thy lovely waist. My closet too shall be oped for thee that we may choose new garments thou mayest wear. I care not what my teachers say supermodel I shall be. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone shall dress my way. Wait for a trick and you shall see. When supermodel I become, my hair shall shine and twirl the sea. From shore to shore the people come to learn how they may look like me. Would I were Tory Spelling, oh, with car and father, just as she, then all would see and curse to low. What fun, what mirth, what joy, what glee. So beautiful, so young am I, I'm sustained by any calorie. The sharp desire, every eye, a supermodel, I shall be. The sharp desire, every eye, a supermodel, I shall be. Aerobic exercise is just the thing to keep the body supple, lean, and fit. Uh, I shall away that you may have your sport. Yeah, tis one, two, three, the suit. Thy bonds do burn to know the truth. Thou shalt be skinny, tis no fast. Just move thy legs and shake thy ass. Tis one, two, three, the suit. Thy bonds of still thou know the truth. Thou shalt be skinny. Tis no fast, just move thy legs, shake thine ass. Tis one, two, three, two, three, two, my dear, you shall know the truth. One, they lack no skill. Each day's exertion shall grow easier if thou be active every passing day and not sporadically as they smell, they smell, thou mayest wish. How does one know if tis sporadically? Methinks I may hurt my sporadic nerves. <laughs> sporadic nerve. Alas, it seemeth thy vocabulary is sporadic too. We must work with thy words and accent if thou wouldst be as presentable as I. Mayhap thou shouldst repeat this phrase hereafter. The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. Learn to the meaning of this useful word. Sporadic means once in a while, my dear. Try thou, use it sometime in thy speech, that thou mayst be accustomed to its sound. I shall, let it make me as wise as thee. Ah. Hereafter, we shall cross train, switching twixt our Lady Cindy Crawford's masterwork, a rober size zounds, and that classic tome of fitness, even steely buns. Past this, we shall both read one book, not school assigned, for education and enjoyment both. My first selections, fit or fat forsooth. Mine is the interstellar tale, men hail from Mars, whilst women hail from Venus. 
An excellent selection by my trough. Act four, scene four, the Horowitz house. Art thou ready? Verily. <laughs> Art thou ready? Verily. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, mine Pete, mine Sorry. Pete. Methinks thou hast orange juice on thy face. <laughs> Hola! Share, thou, thou art returned. Chair, <laughs> welcome home. Uh, apologies for how we parted ways. How doth it feel to have thy driver's license? Hmm? Those fine sensations I cannot describe. I failed my test. Oh, Cher, my sympathy. Josh, spare me all thy lecturing profound upon the subject of the art of driving, how tis a vast responsibility at which by feigning one shall not succeed. Thou drivest every thought thereof from me. Those were thy words, not mine. Thy thoughts speak loud, and now I may clearly hear the words. Here, let us talk a while, for I have aught that I would show thee, which may change thy mean. Is my cue then to bid you both farewell? <laughs> I am most sorry hearing of thy test, yet am so glad thou hast at length arrived. There is a deed that doth fulfillment need, but I'd not undertake it sans thine aid. Can't sparkle still the right Promethean fire? Indeed, one moment we shall have flames. The box thou carriest, what is therein? Tis some few trifles that bring Elton to my mind, and we too, like Pandora, shall discover every evil held within. Unlike the lass of old, though, will not set them free upon the world, but burn them in the pyre, and so release me of their woes. My heart hath moved beyond him, I am sure. Let it be opened. Dost thy mind recall the party in the valley where a shoe did strike upon my pates and knock me cold? Kind Elton brought a towel with ice to help. It was Travis bought the ice, I recall. I was embarrassed at the time to tell, but I brought home the towel as a souvenir. Thou art in jest a towel? Even so, remember thou the song that played whilst we were dancing happily together? He and I, twas that roll with the homie song? A tune forgettable and I forgot. And sentiment, I did the music by and played it over nearly every single night. Hi, I am happy for thee. Tell me what brought on this swelling of empowerment. I met a man whose character amazeth, who makes rank Elton seem most loserly. News wonderful. Wilt thou help me win Josh? To win Josh what? Thou would win him a prize? My meaning is as plain as my delight. I like him. Gladly would I be with him. Think thou his disposition's mutual? Yeah, I do spy some marks of love in him. What signs or signals has he given thee? The littlest items speak with loudest voice. He findest ways to touch or tickle me. Recall when we were lately at the fest and I felt lost, forsaken, and depressed. He rescued me by asking me to dance and whilst we danced, he flirted like a child. Thy face though, look at the pale. Say, art thou well? I shall be. Nay, I cannot tell the truth. Two mochaccinos I did have, which was at least one drink too many. I may burst. And the feeling is precisely no to me. The other day, as I conversed with Josh, we did discuss the difference betwixt the girls of high school versus college girls. The girls of college paint their faces less, which is why lads prefer them over us. Hi, thou, thou does, does thou think that Josh and thou will work? It is a parry made for tales of love. He is a bookworm, nerdy in the height. Am I a head of air and nothing more? Dost thou think me challenged mentally? Nay, no, those words are thine, not mine. Then dost thou mean my status is not high enough for Josh? You two shall not mesh well together. Ty, tis like one is oil, the other water. Thou dost believe we never shall mesh well. 
Why do I listen to the anyways? A virgin with no driver's license, thou. Tis wondrous, harsh, past all necessity. Apologies that I struck thee so low. Let us attempt another parlay once our strong emotions mellow for a spell. Time heal all wounds, so doth the saying go. Until that moment, I bid thee adieu. What have I done to my relationships? Ty is a monster of my own design. A gorgon with steely-eyed resolve. My gorge is rising, mighty chunks therein. I shall vomit if I do not get air. I must outside and rest myself a while. <sighs> All that I think and do is proven wrong. Wrong over Elton and his purposes. Wrong over Christian and what he desires. Wrong over Josh and how I should treat him. To one conclusion doth the kettle boil, which bubbles over with its meaning plain. I am a clueless lass and nothing more. The Josh and Ty romance, if it be so, hath overwrought my mind enormously. Why should I be concerned? Ty is my friend. I never shall begrudge her happiness. If she has suitors, should I not be glad? Why hath she, though, besotted been with Josh? He dresses like a jester wanting laughs. He listened to music horrible. He is not even cute conventionally. He is more slug than man who hangs around the house and bothers me with teasing jibes. How I recall our scenes domestic. He with his mouth stuffed full of savory delights. He have no sense of rhythm, cannot dance. In sooth, I could not take him anywhere. Before mine eyes, I see him at the party as he did jump around with bunny hops. Yet wherefore do I stress about him so? This is but Josh. Indeed, he is a Baldwin with Alec's gentle smile and lovely hair, with William's youthfulness and sense of style, with Stephen's frame and utter goofiness and Daniel's reticence and striking eyes, my heart hath memorized his lovely smile like light that brightens up the darkest room. What joy though would he find in Ty's embrace what could he see in her, a simple girl, he who is older, more intelligent? Mayhap he have the sculptor's eyes, which she's not a lump of rock, but the beauty just beneath, and then by skill reveals the work of art. Methinks she would not make him happy long. Josh needeth someone with imagination, a person who can render him the care he needs, for in some areas he is weak in someone who will laugh at all his jests, though some deserve but little merriment. Aha! The truth is on me suddenly! <gasps> Eureka! I have fallen in love with Josh! Josh! Hey! whom I have known since I was small, who tickles me and jabs me when nearby, who gives me cause to smile when I am sad, whose presence is a comfort in itself, who helped me learn to drive my carriage well, who I do dearly love to torment so, who all these years have been a friend to me, by heaven, it is he who I love, none other, completely, totally, and majorly. My heart doth move toward him utterly. <laughs>
<sighs> this case is tedious past every measure, yet hath a trifold purpose. Verily, to render some assistance unto Mel, to grow mine understanding of the law, and to keep me within the house near share. How goes the work? I'll help thee if thou wishest. My wish is thine, and thou thou wilt help me wipe my work. <laughs> Thy hair hath the appearance of a girl's. Is uh, Pippi Longstockings thy paragon? That hood gives thee the mean of Forrest Gump. I prithee, who is Pippi Longstocking? A part Mel Gibson never hath portrayed. Thou art turned jester. Mm -hmm. I may vomit yet. These two flirt like two cottontails in heat. <clears throat> what, what happened to the files that were just here for August 28th? Beg pardon, what? Mel wanted them tonight. And there were once full double the amount that sit here now. He shall erupt in anger. Where are they? Alas, methinks I checked for their content for the conversations of September 3rd. Well, where didst thou put them, Cher? Two piles created I, dividing them in twain. Was incorrect? We must redo it wholly. Art thou an idiot, thou fawning lout? She did not know. I bid thee watch thy words. I'll not have thee abuse her cruelly. She sent us back another day or more. When no one looks for the September call, she spends her time thereon. We are undone. Apologies. Forget what thou hast done and take thine empty head unto them all. <laughs> what is thy problem, Clackdish? Wherefore be ye so unkind unto this harmless lass? I shall be fired since she moronic is. She is no moron. If thou setst thy mind upon what thou hast been assigned, t'would not have happened. Say thou moron only if thou shalt look in the mirror and so speak. If thou wert working, instead of wooing, she would not be such a bother hereabout. What baseless accusations this, thou rogue? Thou knowest what I mean precisely, Josh. This is a multi-million ducat case, not thine excuse to play at puppy love. We have worked steadily upon this suit with steadfast purpose and unflagging toil. Now thou and she may toil however ye shall, and work upon your purpose of romance. For my part, I shall sickness claim today. Uh. Is true I have destroyed the lawsuit whole? Nay, for destruction thou art suited not. Did I then set him back beyond all hope? So much work still remaineth to be done, and he can ill afford to lose the time. Put all thy hopes on me, my loser friend. For through my care, the work may yet be done. The matter shall not make his spirit ill. No time or labor shall be lost, I swear. Canst thou imagine what the blackguard spake to make thee worry needlessly as he did was an action most detestable. T'was his fault that the work was not fulfilled, <laughs> yet he would blame us for flirtatiousness. Imagine saying we were, <laughs> well, th thou knowest. Thou knowest well and have devoted been unto this case. No fault or blame could e'er fall on thy shoulders who laborest so. The case hath been an opportunity for me to learn more of the law's delays, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. For I, who one day hoped to lawyer be, t'was an experience profound and useful. Thou, though, hath not a need to labor thus. Go out and spend thy days in carefree joy. Unto the mall fly with thy merry friends, and gather thee thy rosebuds whilst thou may. Be like thou thinkst tis all I ever do to pass my days in joyful merriment, experience in spending nothing more, a harpy with her father's ducats armed? Nay, hey, privy, t'was not mine intent at all. Thou, uh, I, um, we. <laughs> my functions fail as though I were a fish who played the harp. Thou, Cher, art young and passing beautiful, and, and I... And, and now? Uh, and, and I, uh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> what? Thou thinks me beautiful? Those were thy words, the few I heard amongst the gibbering. An ounce of beauty hast thou? 
Yea, yours too. In faith, thou knowest thou art gorgeous share. Faith that would make Helen envious. Thou also art most popular, thy clique surrounding thee, and for a swarm of bees, and thou the queen who sits as centerpiece. Yet, oh, <laughs> I almost did forget myself. For this, what quoth I of thy beauty rare is not the reason wherefore I have come expending every day in working here. For I who one day hoped to lawyer be, t'was an experience profound and useful. Those were thy words already, moments hence. If thou repeats thyself, learn not new lines. Another player may be called upon to act the part of lover, sighing like furnace. No other player seek, for I am he. Yet you must remember why I hither came. Mel, I am here for Mel, for he alone doth care about me in this ruthless world. Nay, tis not so. Melodramatic be thou not, and seek not others for this scene, for thy world doth contain abundant care. My father's not alone in loving thee. Oh, is he not? Nay. Dare I one word more? Do thy words mean thou carest for me as well? More care have I than I could ever tell. Ooh. Mm. 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 Tis plain to see what would thereafter hap, yet think ye not it is my nuptials, <laughs> as if. Give yourselves a massive round of applause, everyone. Congratulations. What a show. What a show. Absolutely incredible work. Thank you so much for joining us at home. I'd like to t introduce you now to our cast and crew for this evening, starting as always with our uh, indomitable producer, Sarah Peachy. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. I'm an innovation project manager and actor based in Glasgow. And for the first time, please welcome our guest director for tonight's performance, Alex Pearson. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm a director and a producer, and I'm based in London. Wonderful. And our associate stage manager and master of props, it's Emily Ingram. Hi, my name's Emily. I'm a director, writer, and stage manager based in Edinburgh. Wonderful. And with thanks to our movement director, Henri Cortugno, with additional sound thanks to sound designer Adam Woodhams. Uh, the cast for tonight's performance has been put together by casting director Sydney Aldridge uh, as Cher, Victoria Ray Sook. Hi, I'm Victoria Ray Sook. I'm an actress based in New York City. As Dion, Gemma Genus. Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Gemma Genus, and I'm an actress based in London. As Ty, Rachel Goodman. Hey everyone, I'm Rachel. I'm a writer, actress, and filmmaker based in Los Angeles. As Josh Roland Sterling. Hi everyone, my name's Roland Sterling and I'm an actor based in London. Wonderful. As Clark, MJ Lee. Hi, my name is MJ Lee. I am an actress based in London. As Baltazar, Josh Tucker. Hello, I'm Josh. I'm an actor and musician in London. And finally, as our valiant swing aerobics instructor and anything else that was <laughs> called upon to do, it's Emily Beach. Hello, I'm Emily Beach. I am an actor and presenter uh, in the UK. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Give yourselves another big round of applause. And audience, please send in your questions to either Ian Desha, the writer, or our crew, or the actors, anyone that you want. Uh, let us know what your questions are, and we will do our best to get you those answers. So please send those in, uh, and we will be here ready and waiting to answer them. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, please remember that uh, if you would like to join us for Wednesday's production of Love's Labour's Lost, uh, that's at youtube.com forward slash Rob Miles, which you can uh, check out here uh, and also please comment uh, and put your reactions on social using the hashtag show must go online and pop shakespeare live thank you so much remember also to buy uh, ian desha's work from the quirkbooks.biz website all sales in the month of may of ian's books uh, first percent of the proceeds uh, for those will go to the show must go online so that will be wonderful and finally if you enjoyed tonight's performance if you're a fan of the people that are working on this we also have a patreon.com forward slash the show must go online uh, which you can donate to uh, and it's an opt-in hardship fund for all those actors that are taking part who may have lost work as a result of the covid epidemic so please do uh, feel free to make a donation there as well thank you so much everyone we're hopefully getting the first uh, of your questions through very soon uh, and in the meantime i'd like you to join us next week same time same place right here on the quirkbooks youtube channel for much ado about mean girls that's much ado about mean girls same time same place next week can't wait to see you there and you can just see there in the art artwork the iconic burn book there uh love this artwork mocked up almost like the witches from macbeth here amazing amazing work love it to bits love it to bits ian how did you find that Oh, such great fun. You know, it was it's so different than last week when I was actually there for the, the rehearsals of Star Wars and able to, to see the whole thing coming together. This one, I, I really didn't see much of the process at all. So to see it all come together, just wonderful, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Wonderful. 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 So uh, someone asked who wrote the music that Balthazar played? I think that was one for you, uh, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's me. Who wrote the music? Well, I mean, they're based on the original songs of Kids in America and Supermodel. Um, and yeah, just took, took them and Noodle Around and just sort of covered slash remixed them and put my own sort of twist on it and added different melodies and, on parts of them and yeah, just made it my own. Was it a challenge to resolve uh, the music to an iambic pentameter uh, verse, which is obviously a very different kind of rhythm, isn't it, to what you normally get in music? Yeah, it was a challenge. Uh, yeah, because you had to sort of change the rhythm of a lot of phrases and a lot of melodies and lines and sort of fit fit it in a, in a clever way so it didn't actually come out of time and stuff. Um, but I, I think I prefer the... Uh, Ian's lyrics to the originals now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Um, we've got another question here for Balthazar as well. This, this might be also one for Alex. Um, can you describe the inspiration for his outfit? Um, so I had the idea of making Balthazar a 90s version of Shakespeare. So it's very much based on the 90s fashion sense um, that is so clearly um, beloved in the film and just making it um, part of his trendy outfit. So that's what was quite nice, having you playing old classical Shakespeare and then uh, adding a 90s magic, magical Shakespeare that could lead our story. Amazing. Bravely getting booted off at the beginning there. Yes, enjoyed that immensely. Uh, I also want to shout out Victoria. I re I'm really curious to know how you managed to get the jacket, like the jacket. Uh, quite extraordinary work. Um, so I'm New York City based, but I'm with my mom and dad in Texas right now. And my mom is an amazing seamstress. And when I got cast, we just kind of went through a craft closet and we found this yellow fabric and she was like, I can make you the jacket. And I was, I was so honored and I was just like, yes. And so we were rehearsing and we we're making the jacket and on 10 minute break, she was coming in and measuring me. And then this appeared yesterday and I was so delighted. <laughs> So it's yeah. absolutely incredible. So uh, so many thanks uh, to Victoria's mum for bravely putting that together. Yeah. Extraordinary contribution that. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, and someone's asked as well, Victoria, what can we see you on or in? Oh, thank you. Um, so I run a 
Um, I run a theater company in New York City called Food of Love Productions. We just closed our last show earlier and someday we will be doing our next one, but I'm directing a show of high schoolers right now that missed their final show that will be streaming on June 6th. So if you wanna see those kiddos, it'll, um, it'll be a food of love show. So it'll be little kids online. So that's, that's what's right now. And then someday uh, you, something else, um, usually a food of love show. So as soon as I know, you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Got a couple more questions here. Uh, was all of it done live or was some of it recorded? The, in, the timing of the props was so impressive. So, um, the answer is it's all done live with um, the exception of maybe one sequence, which was, I think, the hair dye going into the to uh, into the toilet. <laughs> it didn't go into the toilet, into the bathroom, <laughs> down the bath. Uh, so <laughs> uh, but yes, that was pre-recorded uh, because obviously you never know which way the colours are going to come out. But other than that, yes, entirely live. And all the actors, performances, everything that you're seeing from them, all of Josh's music, everything performed live exactly as it would be in a theatre. Uh, so thank you for that question. Yeah. Yes, we are 100% live. Um, also, was the fountain done live with people bringing laptops into the bathroom? You'll see a, not, a lot of nodding heads here. I, I'll give you a little behind the scenes anecdote. I was one of the fountains. Uh, I was the gaffer tape shower head in the bottom of the bath. And when I turned it on, a drop of water hit my mouse pad and it stopped working entirely. So I couldn't get it to turn on on the queue. So I think it was about five seconds behind, but that's live, you know, that's live theater. And that's also putting into uh, electronics in with water. It generally doesn't mix very well, so it could have been far worse. Uh, wonderful. I've uh, got a question here for Ian. How do you decide which films uh, to adapt? Are they films you have a particular affection for or, or are they chosen for their adaptability? Um, I would say they are chosen for their popularity and adaptability. Uh, we want to be, you know, they, they're, the Pop Shakespeare series has been a conversation between me and Quirk Books saying what movies would be fun to do. Uh, having done all the Star Wars movies, uh, what, you know, what are movies that might attract a whole different readership uh, to, to these books? Um, and so uh, Mean Girls is one that I had seen, I think, once before I adapted it. Uh, and so I loved it. You know, it's great. And I, and I love Tina Fey. Uh, and so it, it wasn't, a, you know, it was a pleasure to do. And Clueless is one that I sort of had more of a history with. Um, and so, but these are decisions that are, um, you know, that I make with my publisher. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to imagine them coming to me and saying, hey, how about this one? And me saying, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of what the movie would be because uh, I don't think they would come to me with something that wouldn't be fun to do. Amazing, amazing. I've got a question here for Rachel Goodman. You mentioned you're a writer as well. Uh, what kinds of books do you write or is it something else that you write? Yeah, uh, I, yeah so I write novels um, under the pen name Rachel Radner after Gilda Radner, who was my inspiration growing up. Um, she was on SNL, the original SNL. Um, but yeah, I write romance novels under that pen name and I'm also starting to write fantasy. I don't have anything published under fantasy, but in the vein of Star Wars, except my own take on space opera fantasy. Amazing, I'm gonna check those out. I, I'm a huge fan of space opera as well. So I'm glad that question was asked cause now I have something to go and read. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, how did Rachel do the double mascara? <laughs> oh man. Um, okay, well, so it was, I already like pre-applied the makeup before, not to spoil the magic, but because of the glasses, I figured no one was gonna see that it was done ahead of time. And so when the mascara was being put on, I was just, you know, not really doing it, but yeah, just <laughs> sorry to spoil things. For <laughs> the magic of theater, not at all, not at all. It's all, it's all illusions, isn't it? It's all uh, magicianship, absolutely. Yes, we've got a cameo from Emily's cat. We love Emily's cat. Yes, wonderful. Oh, delightful. Always lovely to have animals on screen. Um, when uh, We've got one here. How did you show or hide the correct Zoom screens? Uh, so a really, a really technical question here, but uh, the simple answer is we get the actors to turn them off when they're not in the scene and on when they are. And it, and it is as simple as that. And then they disappear. 
uh, and you get a lovely effect from it when you're in gallery view on Zoom. So that's how we do that. Uh, really deceptively simple, but it does mean that the actors have to do all their own entrances and exits, just like they would in live theatre. Uh, there's never a stage manager shoving them on. <laughs> so uh, similarly here, they're turning them off and on again for themselves. It's so that's how we do that. stage manager pulling them off. Okay. We do have, oh, oh, that's true, yes. When we have impossible to reach buttons, we do have stage managers essentially hitting the kill switch. And we also have our stage managers rampantly changing names for people while they're doing quick changes. Uh, in this one, probably more than any one that we've done so far, everyone was multi-rolling. Everyone was playing loads of uh, kind of caricatures of the different characters that uh, are referenced through the text. And because of that, while they were frantically doing that, we had Emily and we had Sarah going in there, hacking their accounts and being like, we're going to change your name to this. Uh, so uh, a lot of trust players in as by actors there as well which is wonderful um i've got another question here uh where did balthazar train i trained at east 15 acting school um in loughton and i trained on the acting and contemporary theater course which is a brilliant course uh because it encourages you to use other skills as well as acting uh, and pushes you to create your own work so i was able to develop music a lot there. I also did some directing at the at a result as a result of the course, and you can do a lot of writing as well. So all sorts of skills. But yeah, East of Team is where I trained and on that course, which is shortened to CT. It's a brilliant course. Awesome, awesome. So I hope that recommendation finds its mark uh, for whoever's <laughs> asking the question. I'm sure they're asking it very deliberately. Um, how was it for Alex coordinating everything? Ah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, so much fun. I did a lot of prep work beforehand to come up with some ideas um, that I could feed to the actors. So we had a starting point and then we went through the script first and looked at all the major points when who was doubling who and what points they were going to come in at and the points where I needed everyone, such as the fountains and also uh, Ty's transformation scene. Um, and then also with my fabulous cast who came on, were really patient, dedicated, hardworking, um, brought their ideas, tried things, suggested things and um, just uh, put it all together in two days. So just really, really, really well done to a wonderful, fabulous cast and for, you know, trusting me and for trusting themselves to do it. So really, guys, well done. Amazing work, all of you. Amazing work, Alex, as well. I know it can be a daunting thing jumping into a, a brand new medium for the first time and then having to do a show in two days. It is no mean feat by any means, but that preparation absolutely paid off. And one of the, the joys that I have getting to see this, this is the first time we've ever had a guest director come and do a show. Uh, so this was a little bit like sending your kid off to their first day of school and being like, ah! Uh, but I really didn't have to worry because it was wonderful work put together by a, a wonderful team. Obviously, we had uh, Emily there as well Sarah there as well and Alex leading them uh, and then our incredible cast who um, you know took the advice to get carried away and bring their uh, own ideas to the table and really kind of uh, grew it up and, and made it flourish uh, and it was just so exciting to watch that process take place as a spectator for the first time so congratulations to you all and particularly to you Alex you've done a tremendous job so really really well done. Um, and also, uh, for those of you watching at home, I mentioned much ado about Mean Girls. This is going to be directed by Emily Ingram next week. So congratulations, Emily. Can't wait to see what you do uh, with uh, this. You've been such uh, an absolute core pillar of the work that Show Must Go, Show Must Go Online does uh, in terms of all your innovation and ingenuity. And I can't wait to see how that comes to fruition when you're in the driver's seat next week. It's going to be really, really wonderful to see. Um, Gemma. Have you done any theatre in London? I have indeed, yes. <laughs> um, I re I my last sort of bigger show was Tina the Musical, Tina the Teller Musical at the Aldrich Theatre, and then I was in Peter Pan, the national version, um, in White City. Yeah, so you, you may have seen me given a little bit of this. <laughs> <laughs> amazing amazing i love it i love it uh someone's asked here when did you have the idea to do a live performance over zoom and how quickly did it come together uh the answer is from idea to first execution was six days we put the first tweet out on a friday it blew up we went oh wow people really seem to be into this we should probably do it and let's do it quickly uh and so i think we were the first people to do shakespeare via zoom uh, online uh and i think it's it's kind of launched a thousand ships 
groups. There's all, all kinds of people now looking at how they can do digital theatre differently, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, but yes, the answer to that, uh, in short, is six days. So yeah, not much time at all. And then we've been going constantly since then. Uh, we've done nine shows in eight weeks, 10 shows now with this one. So this is our 10th show. So that's a lovely anniversary. And just to round that off, we're also celebrating getting 100,000 views across all of our different shows. So that is a really, really massive milestone. So thank you to all those that have tuned in so far. And if you're tuning into this for the first time, please do come to youtube.com forward slash Rob Miles uh, at 7 p.m. BST and 2 p.m. EDT uh, to watch Love's Labour's Lost on Wednesday because I think we'll really enjoy it. Um, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and then I think that might be all for our questions. So I'd like to just finish with one more for Ian, and this is a personal question, and it's one that maybe you might not be able to answer, but I would like to know <laughs> if there was one movie that you could adapt into Shakespeare's style that you haven't done already, which one would it be? What's the white whale? Uh, Princess Bride is my white whale. Um, in doing some sort of a combination of... Uh, the book and the movie, um, you know, where you'd get sort of the the action of the movie, and that's that's the story you would tell. But then the characters would be soliloquizing, uh, talking about their histories that are rounded out in the book itself. Um, Wonderful. I would love to do it. That's not nearly as personal of a question as it could have been. That yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, I've got you live on air. I can really get the hot pokers out. No, not at all, mate. Not at all. I think that Princess Bride would be absolutely incredible because, of course, you've got all the rapier stuff anyway, which adapts so well into the Elizabethan setting. I think it's something I can tell you right now uh, that the live chat uh, is uh, is going absolutely nuts with our cast right now. We're all reacting to the idea of the Princess Bride one day becoming a reality. So we are all excited about it. I hope you're excited about it. I hope the powers that be might be listening in uh, and might be amenable to that possibility because I think we'll, we would all absolutely love it. So that is all of our questions and that's all of our time indeed for this evening. So thank you so much for joining us. Come back uh, uh, to this channel, same time next week. Please subscribe to the channel, like this video, uh, tune in next week for much ado about Mean Girls. We can't wait, I hope you can't wait either. And find us at youtube.com slash Rob Miles uh, on Wednesday for Love's Labour's Lost. Thank you all so much and good night.